Good morning and welcome in the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, where today in the gospel our Savior teaches us to bear our crosses, clothed in his strength, clothed in his willingness, for he bore his cross first for us. We learn more about that in the readings and in the sermon for today. We will use the service setting one from our blue hymnals on page 154 and begin with the first four stanzas of, of 836, I Walk in Danger All the Way. Now, as you are comfortable and able, please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. 
I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The congregation may be seated. If anyone is to come after me, Jesus said, he must deny himself, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We see that even as Satan schemed to oust Job's faith, God permitted it as a test so that his name might be praised despite what Job uh, was looking at as far as losses were concerned. His hope still remained in the Lord. Job chapter 1. One day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their oldest brother, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the female donkeys were grazing nearby when the Sabaeans swooped down and took them away. They put the servants to death with the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another servant came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the flocks and the servants and consumed them, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another servant came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and plundered the camels and took them away. They put the servants to death with the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another servant came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and were drinking wine in the house of their oldest brother. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it collapsed on the young people, and they died, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. 
Then Job stood up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshipped. Then he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be blessed. In all this, Job did not sin or blame God. The word of the Lord. Our psalm for this Sunday of the Lenten season is Psalm 22, we sing together. Continuing now in God's word with our second lesson from Romans chapter 5, where St. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, tells us that God uses the sufferings and the trials of our life to shape our character, to refine our faith and trust in him, for our faith is built on his gracious promises. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice confidently on the basis of our hope for the glory of God. Not only this, but we also rejoice confidently in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces patient endurance and patient endurance produces tested character, and tested character produces hope. And hope will not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 
For at the appointed time, while we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. It is rare indeed that someone will die for a righteous person. Perhaps someone might actually go as far as to die for a person who has been good to him. But God shows his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, since we have now been justified by his blood, it is even more certain that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, it is even more certain that, since we have been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. And not only to, is this so, but we also go on rejoicing confidently in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received this reconciliation. The word of the Lord. The congregation, please stand as we sing now the gospel acclamation for Lent. gospel appointed for this second Sunday in the Lenten season from the gospel of Mark chapter 8. Jesus began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the experts in the law, be killed and after three days rise again. He was speaking plainly to them. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But after turning around and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have your mind set on the things of God, but the things of men. He called the crowd and his disciples together and said to them, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. After all, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? In fact, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The gospel of our Lord Jesus. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we sing our next hymn, Lord, Thee I Love With All My Heart.
Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Be not far from us, for you are our strength. Amen. The lesson for consideration today is the gospel lesson from Mark chapter 8, the words of Jesus. Dear friends, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. These words from the Gospel of Mark have a different tone and a different weight than the words that we looked at last week. Last week we were comforted to hear and to know that God is for us, that we are conquerors through Christ. Today Jesus' words present something sobering, something difficult. Something that if it were left up to me and you, we'd rather not have. Imagine the thoughts of the crowd and of the disciples as Jesus is speaking. They, they knew what a cross was. If you were outside the city of Jerusalem, there was the designated place of Roman execution. Bodies hanging, life slowly draining from them. Filthy, stinking, rotting flesh. The intended message, follow the rule of Rome or else pay the consequences. A message that instilled fear and shame. Is that what Jesus wants? Submissive followers operating out of fear and under threat. No, Jesus wants willing followers that trust him. Followers that know just as the cross they endure for their Savior is real, so also the life that it brings, that it leads to, is real. And the first question we have to grapple with this morning is what exactly defines a cross. The most common definition that we hear is suffering. Any suffering that we experience in this life. However, as we look at the words of the Savior, he says something very specific. That is not to say that things like our illnesses cannot be part of a cross. But look at the specific words of Jesus. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. The cross is whatever we suffer as a result of being connected to Christ. Because we are Christians, there will be a cross for us to bear. What will that cross be made out of? Jesus says, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself. We understand that this includes being persecuted by the unbelieving world for what we believe in, for the sake of Christ. We understand that a servant is not above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the master of the house was called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household. We should expect to be disliked and even hated because of Jesus and like Jesus was. We also know that we will make choices in how we conduct our lives as we walk the path of righteousness laid out for us. We know not to be lazy in our work and always do everything to the best of our ability. Spouses know to love and honor and cherish one another. Children know to obey their parents. 
We know we should practice things like self-sacrifice and generosity. The list goes on and on and on. To fully grasp what self-denial should be is to hear Jesus express for us the summary of God's law in the New Testament, what is deemed the law of love. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The epitome of self-denial is realizing first comes love for God in all things. Second comes love for your neighbor. Loving them at the very least equal to as much as how you love yourself. You'll note, self, you, is nowhere on the list. That's cross-bearing. Putting yourself last. Therein lies the spiritual struggle. The devil tempts us, along with our own sinful nature, to throw off the cross we have been given. And one way they might come at us is by a self-righteous attitude. Because all can be going relatively well in your life and mine. You have a good home, you have good health, you're doing well at work. God has blessed you richly. When you look around compared to others that you see, things really aren't that bad. You know some of the messes that other people have gotten themselves into, and you're glad you don't have to deal with their problems. It feels good to know that you are not the worst of the worst. God should be happy with me. I know, I know I'm not perfect, but God's got it covered. Does that sound like self-denial to you? It sounds like arrogance before God, which can bleed through to how we treat our neighbor. You get impatient with them, frustrated with them. Perhaps you think less of them, be they longtime friend or one-time stranger. See, pride, sinful pride, doesn't leave room for faith in the heart. So God, in his wisdom, may send circumstances that strip away such a self-absorbed attitude. Difficulties can be introduced into our lives, so pride doesn't swallow us whole. It may not be pretty, but the purpose, God's purpose, is good. Because God knows that self-righteousness has no place in his children. He wants us to realize how persistent and destructive and insidious pride can be in our lives so that we are left with no recourse except to turn to him in repentance, leaning on his mercy. Another pitfall that we struggle with in our cross of self-denial is despair. The weight is too heavy. You examine yourself against the law of love, and you know you fall exceedingly short. And it all adds up. The times you envied someone else and were motivated in your actions by jealousy. The time you inflicted pain on your spouse or on your children. The time you became bitter because you thought that God was unfair giving someone else what you thought you deserved. So many thoughts, so many words, so many actions you have had have proven themselves contrary to serving God and serving your neighbor as you should. You just can't get it right. 
particularly if you're addicted to a particular sin that has dogged you for so long. You should be better. You know that. And yet, why? Why do you fail when the devil pushes that button or this button? It's not too long before other thoughts start to enter our mind. I guess God is punishing me for my continuous disobedience. He says he loves me. He says he forgives me. But it's got to have a limit. I don't feel forgiven because I cannot forgive myself. I deserve all that is happening to me. Disturbing. It's disturbing whether you are hopelessly filled with despair or saturated by sinful pride. Or maybe it's right in the middle, a mix of both. We've all been tempted to be caught up in arrogance or stay wallowing in self-pity. It does not matter to Satan. It doesn't matter which way we fall, just so long as we fall and our faith, as a result, is ousted. That was his intent when it came to Job. If you remember when he was allowed to come into God's presence, he said, take away all he has, all that Job has, and he will surely curse you, God, to your face. However, Job praised God through trial and glorified his name. Job didn't rely on himself. He trusted God in good and ill. And later on, of course, he would say those beautiful words, I know, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the end of time he will stand over the dust. Then even after my skin has been destroyed, nevertheless in my own flesh, I will see God. To bear our cross, we must focus first on the one who bore his cross for us. The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the experts of the law, be killed, and on the third day be raised again. Nothing, nothing would keep Jesus from this goal. Not even a disciple whom he loved. Not even the disciple who said, no, no. Never, Jesus, may this never happen to you. The temptation presented by Satan was an easy shortcut that Jesus could have taken. However, it was not in line with that plan of salvation. It didn't mesh with humbling himself and being obedient to death, even death on a cross. So it is met with a stiff rebuke. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have your mind set on the things of God, but the things of men. Back off. My suffering, Satan, is necessary. This is why I have come. I must endure my cross. Yes, it will hurt. Yes, the pain will be excruciating hell. But through that cross, you, Satan, will be defeated. Sin's hold over hearts will be broken. And then, then will come my resurrection, leaving no shadow of a doubt that I have won and heaven is open. Because death itself has lost its sting. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel that displays the height and depth of Jesus' love for you. There is no length to which he did not go to make you his very own. 
The gospel tells you that all your sins are paid for. So when you face trial, you're not facing God's retribution for your sins you have committed. Jesus did that for you on the cross, and that is where your sins are nailed. The gospel convinces you that you have peace with God. He loves you more than an earthly father could ever love his children. So you can trust him to care for you and provide for you in all circumstances and work all things, as scripture says, for your good. And you can even trust him to take every scheme of Satan that he intends for harm, God can take all of those schemes and turn them into blessings that strengthen you. You know, you know that suffering produces patient endurance, and patient endurance produces tested character, and tested character produces hope. And hope will not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who always, always lifts our eyes so that we look at the Savior, so that we focus on him. What does the Holy Spirit say as he strengthens us? See what Jesus has done, suffered for you died for you, willingly, without a moment's regret. See his selfless love for you. He is your source of forgiveness and life and light. You have the ability now to love, truly love, because Jesus loved you first. You can practice self-denial and serve your God and your neighbor because Jesus undeniably puts you first. And so now you can put others and God ahead of yourself. Love that comes from God strengthens us to do, to live under the cross as we should. Jesus is our endless source of strength, which helps you shoulder that cross and follow safely in his footsteps. For it is not yourself that you are relying on, but the Savior in whom you have found your stay and strength. Your soul is still because he is on your side. My friends, yes, yes, the cross and its burden and difficulty are real. But have no fear. The life you have for the sake of the gospel is real. Life now, which keeps you in the strength of Christ, and life eternal, which shares in the glory of Christ, all because of his cross for you. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of our human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our Christian faith today with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray. We give glory to your name, O Lord, for your steadfast love and faithfulness. Our trust in you has never been misplaced, for you have been our help and shield. You have been mindful of your own, and we have experienced your blessings. From this time forth and even forevermore, we bless and praise you, O Lord. We regret, gracious Father, that we have often caused you sorrow by our many transgressions. We have not rejoiced in our sufferings, nor have we denied ourselves in order to take up our cross and follow your Son. We have been reluctant to sacrifice any of our comforts for his sake. We have neglected many opportunities to confess him before others. For our many sins of neglect, we beg your forgiveness. Send us your Holy Spirit, that he may strengthen our faith in our Savior Jesus Christ, Help us to trust in him as the only way between earth and heaven. Lead us to recognize that through suffering for your sake, we develop endurance, which lets us live in hope. May we constantly rejoice in the certainty of our salvation. This we ask in the name of him who justified us in your sight by his blood, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated now as our offering is received. We now prepare to receive our Lord's Supper. Please stand. truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn, by a tree, be overcome. 
Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed is he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent to be our Savior our Redeemer and the Messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit. Unite us as one and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, he gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us, O Christ, Lamb of God. You take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us, O Christ, Lamb of God. You take away. congregation may be seated and we first commune those who wish to remain in their pews today. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink, this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink, this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus, this gift which he has given especially for you, strengthen you and keep you in the one true faith until everlasting life. Depart in peace and be assured your sins are forgiven. Amen.
the supper has ended, we stand and we give our thanks with the responses. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated and we'll sing the remaining hymn verses of, uh, of our first hymn. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome one and all to worship on this Sunday. Special welcome to uh, maybe a, a higher number of those who might be worshiping us online due to illness and whatnot. We thank you that you have found us, and we pray that uh, you will join us in person at the feet of the Savior soon. By way of announcements, nothing really new to report. It's all there for you. Keep in mind, of course, the Easter flower sign-up deadline, uh, which is coming up on March 10th. Still plenty of room if you need, uh, if you would like flowers. Still pretty, uh, plenty of room for your last name and the quantity which you want. And then, of course, uh, do not forget about uh, gentlemen. Uh, next week is the beginning of the month, so we will have our boards meeting. Uh, and also Wednesday, another opportunity for you to be strengthened by our Lord Jesus as we continue uh, our series, God on Trial. And uh, please be kind and courteous and gentle as it will be Pastor Wessel's first time uh, leading uh, this congregation in the Lenten rotation, the second pastor now that serves uh, St. Bart's Cacallan. We go from here, dearly loved, dearly loved in Christ, God wants it, God has it, no other way. Even as we must suffer for his name's sake, we are given the strength to do so because Christ suffered for us first. And we know that as we bear our cross here on earth, there is a crown of glory waiting for us at the appointed time. May Jesus give you strength in whatever you face this week and always.